All right, and thanks again for uh, for joining in with us. So we're going to be talking a little bit about estate planning and about planning for your futures. And you know, one of the things that is um, really important and interesting when we talk about this topic is a lot of a lot of times people will say, "Well, I don't have an estate plan, so why do I need to worry about this?" And the reality is that everybody has something that they need to protect. And so um, you know, we'll get into that. But over this last year, you know, 2020 and COVID and everything that's been happening, you, you never know what the event or the unexpected situation that may come up that could cause a need for these documents or for what we're going to talk about in terms of planning today, right? And the reality is that these situations come up more often than we would like. It might not be that somebody dies or it might not be that somebody becomes incapacitated necessarily. There may be a situation where somebody that you trust needs to manage important decisions on your behalf. And a lot of times we imagine that these things are automatic, right? We think, well, of course, you know, if I can manage things for my spouse. I can access their bank accounts or I can make medical decisions for them. Of course, we're married. I'm going to be able to do that. But it's not automatic. That's not something that, you know, automatically is going to, uh, to happen. And because it's not automatic, it requires that you have certain documents in place. So we're going to talk about, you know, what are those important documents to make sure that you do have in place so that in the event of an emergency or an, an emergency situation, that those concerns can be addressed and that somebody that you trust can step in and be able to help, right? Our family, well, so let me start by just saying, you know, the first thing that uh, virtually everybody needs to have in regards to planning is what we just talked about is a financial power of attorney. The purpose for the financial power of attorney is to allow somebody to make financial decisions and manage financial assets if you're unable to do it for yourself. So if you're still alive, but you're unable to do it for yourself, then this document allows somebody to step in and to be able to manage those things and, and do it for you, right? And so if you're married, you know, sometimes we think, well, that's, of course, you know, I can manage my spouse's accounts. But if you go to the bank and you say, I wanna access my wife's account, or I wanna access my husband's account, are they just gonna let, give you access just because you're married? That's not how it works, right? They have to look and see whether you have whether you're a signer on the account or whether you're an owner on the account, if you're authorized to access the account, right? And so this is an important document because if you got to the point where you couldn't manage your own affairs or make decisions or you needed somebody to access, you know, just day-to-day -day expenses for you on your behalf, this document would empower somebody to do that. And the second situation that is common, or at least could be common, that virtually everybody should address with some basic documents is the same sort of concern, but for healthcare decisions. So there's a document called the Healthcare Power of Attorney. And depending on the state you're in, it may be known as a Healthcare Power of Attorney, an Advanced Healthcare Directive. Uh, you know, th there's a version of it called the Living Will. These documents empower somebody to make decisions on your behalf in regards to healthcare if you're unable to do it for yourself, right? And so our family had a scare when my sister was going to, to college. She was in her second year of college. And uh, she, at the time, she wasn't married. She didn't have any kids. She didn't own any property. Um, you know, most people would have said, well, she doesn't really need an estate plan. Why does she need an estate plan? She's, she's young, she doesn't have any kids. She doesn't have assets. What's the big deal? But she found herself unconscious in the hospital, right? And the hospital called my parents. And they, uh, they asked my parents, do you have a healthcare directive? Do you have a medical power of attorney? Do you have anything like that? And of course, they had to say no, because they didn't, right? They hadn't even thought of it. And so the hospital said, well, we can't tell you anything, but your daughter's here. Why does that happen? Because there's a law called HIPAA. HIPAA prevents them, right, the medical facility from sharing your private medical information, unless what? Unless they have something in writing giving permission for them to share that information, right? 
And at the time, my sister didn't have anything in writing authorizing my parents to receive that information. So what do they have to do? They had to drive for two and a half hours to the hospital. And luckily, by the time they got there, she was conscious and she could get permission to be able to uh, release that information. They could, they could step in and they could help. Things turned out okay, right? So those are the situations that get scary because if you don't have the documents in place, your only recourse is to be able to get that permission through a court of law. And the, the court system, first of all, it can take a long time. It can be expensive. It can cause a lot of stress and family problems, right? And the last thing you wanna to have to worry about in, in a crisis or in an emergency is trying to get the legal authority to make decisions through the court system, right? But that process in the case of incapacity is known as a guardianship or a conservatorship, right? And again, can be expensive, can take a long time, can cause family problems. Most people prefer to avoid that. It's very easy to avoid it by simply having these documents in place and authorizing somebody to be able to make those decisions on your behalf. Now, when we think about estate planning, most of the time we think about when we die, right? And so it's most important to have those documents once you have more to protect, specifically not in terms of money or assets, but in terms of people, right? So when you have children, that's when it's important to have what we call a last will and testament. And your will does three things for you. Number one, it allows you to nominate the person who is going to be able to make decisions and manage assets and divide out everything according to your wishes. That person is called an executor or a personal representative. You get to nominate that person in your will, right? So you have some clarity on who's going to be in charge of things if something happens to you. Number two, your will allows you to be able to decide how those things will be divided. So if you own a home, if you own assets, if you have savings, if you have you know anything that you have that you want to distribute out to individuals or to beneficiaries, your will can specify who would receive those items or those properties or those values and how, right? And the court is going to follow what your will says uh, if, you're, if you've done the will properly. Number three, you, you get to decide and you get to nominate who would be the guardian for your minor children. And this is the single biggest benefit that most families, especially young families, get from having a properly structured estate plan. Because if you have minor children and you don't have something in writing, the state has a plan for you. The state says that any interested party can nominate themselves to be the guardian for your children, right? I don't know about you, but you know, my family, I have some interested parties that I don't want raising my kids. Does that make sense? And if I don't put it in writing, if I don't specify who I want as the guardian for my children, then any interested party can nominate themselves. So, you know, there may be some of my siblings that might not be a good fit to raise my kids, right? Or, you know, all my kids are still young. The oldest one just turned eight recently. And in order for them to, you know, they're not old enough to be able to explain to somebody how they should be raised, you know, what kind of religion I want them raised in, uh, at what time they need to go to bed, right? Curfew, uh, you know, what age we want them dating, what kind of movies we want them to watch, you know, all those things that as a parent are important to me that I'd want to specify, I'd want to give direction on, I'd want to have a voice in. But if I pass away, I'm not going to be able to express those things. So I need to put it in writing because even in the with the best intentions, somebody else is not going to know to do those things. And sometimes they don't have the best intentions, right? And I'll share a story with you. There was a young couple, they had two little kids. Uh, they live in Southern California and uh, they had gone down across the border to, um, to TJ for, uh, for the weekend, right? And they were coming back to San Diego and on the way back, they got hit by a truck. They both passed away. The two little kids were being taken care of by grandma. And grandma had, had helped take care of them ever since they were born, right? Uh, was part of the family and, and expected that she was going to be the guardian for them because of course her son just died and you know she was taking care of them and, and she loved these kids and she wanted to be the guardian for them. So she nominates herself and the judge says, 
you can't take care of these kids. You know, grandma, you, you live in uh, a one bedroom apartment. You're living on social security. You don't have enough income. You don't have enough assets to be able to raise these kids. And what happens if something happens to you? No, I'm not going to give you these kids. We need somebody else. So, you know, grandma's heartbroken. The kids have to go into foster care for two weeks, uh, sorry, two months, while the family is trying to decide who's going to actually get guardianship. And they finally, the court finally settled and gave guardianship to one of the aunts. The reason they gave it to her was because she had a strong, stable income and, uh, and, and you know, she had a house and she could take care of them. But she was single. She wasn't, you know, she never had any intention of having kids and uh, didn't want to have any kids. What kind of a life are they going to have? And, and that isn't what the parents would have wanted. But because they didn't put it in writing, they didn't have a voice anymore, right? And so this is about empowering your family and about empowering your loved ones to make sure that whatever you would want to have happen is what's going to be honored and followed when you're gone. So the last will and testament is, is where you express that. And then finally, if you own real estate and you have children, then that's the benchmark that we look at to recommend the last piece of this puzzle, which we call a living will or a living trust. Your revocable living trust is an instrument that allows you to nominate a person that can manage and make decisions and, and handle things on your behalf if you're unable to do it for yourself without having to go through the court system. So you set up this structure and you set up somebody who can make these decisions on your behalf while you're alive. That person's called a trustee, by the way. While you're alive, you're probably going to be your own trustee. And if you're unable to serve as trustee, then you, you decide who you trust, who you want to put into that role to be able to make decisions and to be able to manage things on your behalf. And, um, and then they step into your shoes when you're unable to serve as a trustee. And then they get to manage everything that's in your trust. So it kind of works like this. You have your trust and you have the manager for the trust, the trustee. They can only manage what's inside of the trust. So it's kind of like this box. If you have real estate, we need to retitle the real estate into the trust. If you have insurance accounts or bank accounts or savings accounts, retirement accounts, we want to uh, put beneficiary designations to the trust on those accounts. If you own a business, you either need to have a business succession plan to make sure that your business is gonna continue running or something's going to be done with it and what you would want to have happen happens when you're gone. Or you need to, again, have it flow through your trust so that your trustee can make those decisions. So all of your assets then flow through this vehicle, this trust, which has instructions and the trust says how it's going to be divided. So if you have children, for example, you say, I wanna leave this to my kids you can do that. And you can actually specify how that's supposed to happen. So maybe I don't want my kids to get all the money all at once because the average inheritance lasts less than seven months, right? Statistically, whether it's a million dollars or a hundred million dollars, it's usually spent within a short period of time. Maybe that wasn't the intention, right? And so maybe I want to protect my kids from having all this wealth all at once, or maybe I want to protect what they receive from potential divorces or creditors. Maybe I want to make sure that, you know, it's spread out over their lifetime. Maybe I want to set aside some money for them to be able to use specifically for college, or maybe I want to leave some to my kids, but I want to leave some to my grandkids. Or maybe you even decide that you want to leave something from generation to generation to generation, right? All of those instructions are built into this document here with your trust. And you can put whatever guidelines or instructions make sense for your family situation. Every family is different. And so it's not a one size fits all solution, right? We got to address it based on what the actual need is for your specific family, for your specific situation. But, but that's basically how it functions. 
And then once your trust is in place, then there's no need for your trustee stepping into your shoes to go to court and to be able to have the transfer of assets or anything happen in that way because it's a private document and it can happen more or less automatically, right? It's a seamless process. And so, you know, the trust would receive these assets, the trustee would make the decision and you don't have to have just one trustee, you could put more than one trustee to serve together, to serve jointly. Or, you know, we always recommend that you have one trustee and you're gonna have successor trustees because what if this person can't make it, right? You need to have the follow-up option, right? And, and the trust will always have instructions for where the assets go if something goes wrong. So um, with that, that's the basics of estate planning in general. The last thing, these are the six areas of advanced planning that we can assist with. Everything from incapacity planning, planning for the future, make sure that you can pay for long-term care needs um, on the estate planning front, you know, addressing, making sure that we're avoiding estate taxes, that we're making sure that things pass on properly without any problems. We do, you know, business planning, everything from the startup process of forming the businesses to making sure that everything that you need from the operational standpoint is in place. And then the preparation for an exit that we can avoid taxes on the exit or we can make sure that the succession plan is in place properly. And then on the asset protection planning front to make sure that you're protecting yourself from potential liability lawsuits and so on and so forth. When it comes to tax planning, a lot of people already have a CPA, but your CPA is looking backwards and saying, how do I save you money last year on what you did? We look forward and we say, how do we put structures in place so that next year, when you meet with your CPA, you have more options so that they can save you more money, right? And then finally, legacy planning. Uh, sometimes clients want to leave multi-generational assets and build a dynasty, build a, a legacy that they can leave for charity or for their family from generation to generation to generation. So that's what we do. Wow, Glenn, thank you for that simple yet direct explanation of proper estate planning. Many of you might be thinking, what's next? How do I put an estate plan in place for myself and my family? Click the link below to schedule an appointment to discuss estate planning needs for yourself.